Hello, everyone. I'm Erin. I'm Data's Chief Strategy Officer and also Data's most enthusiastic trade show swag collector. Yes, I'm Seth. I'm a consultant at Data and also probably most likely become your trade show best friend within about 15 seconds. And today, hey, as I'm sure you all know, we're, we're here to talk about trade shows. So we, we talk to a lot of companies that say that trade shows are a pretty big part of their sales and marketing budget. And they cost a lot more than just the direct expense of the booth materials, right? Like you've got travel and personnel and, and, and the opportunity cost of pulling salespeople away for days or sometimes even a full week. Like shows are expensive. They offer a lot of potential, but if you're just walking into a show, you know, setting up your booth and hoping for the best, there's a good chance you're going to be disappointed. Well, let's avoid disappointment, shall we? Here's what we're going to walk through today. So we'll start with the sales prep side of trade shows, followed closely by the marketing prep, talk about the day of activity, and then discuss post-show follow-ups and review. We will have time at the end for Q&A discussion, and I believe we have at least one more poll planted somewhere in the journey here, so stay tuned. Nice, yeah. And, and we're going to take you through a lot of individual ideas and activities you can put in place, but probably the most important part is your system. So what, what's your trade show system? You know, what does your company do before, during, and after the show? Because without a clear system... You're never going to stay consistent, and these ideas are going to fly away, you know, faster than you at trade show teardown hour. Uh, so we're going to start with sales prep. As salespeople, you're responsible for you're responsible for lead generation and building your network at the show, but your time is is pretty limited, and it's easy it's easy to waste a lot of time pretty quickly uh, when you're when you're actually there. So in order to make the most of the time that you have at the show, you have to commit to some real preparation. So first, you have to know who's going to be there. Figure out what the attendees look like. Oftentimes a show is going to publish an exhibitor list. So go deep on that if you can. It's pretty high value. You know, make a list of, of every person or company you want to make sure that you talk to before you go. I like to put the list in a little notebook I carry with me. It really helps you focus, especially at a big show. Um, next, you're going to want to reach out to the people on your list. Uh, I like to use email sequencing uh, before the show. So like ask if you can get them coffee on Thursday morning. Or, or, if, or if they have happy hour plans on Wednesday evening, or if they want to join you and maybe a, a group for lunch on Tuesday. Um, so it, do, do reach out and do something like that before the show. Uh, so in addition to the, to the list and, con and contact planning, uh, you're going to want to do some pitch prep before the show, really considering who's going to be there. So what value points do you really need to nail when it comes to talking to this show specific audience? Uh, and then finally, you got to make a plan. You got to make a plan with your team. And it doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but you should have a plan to cover, you know, cover the booth, to walk the floor, to take some breaks. Uh, if you're exhibiting, please don't, please don't go alone or let anyone try to run a solo show. Like you have to bring enough coverage to make the show worth it. And, and in general, uh, the, the most extroverted person on your team is probably the person who should be involved. Uh, so with all that in mind, I'm going to run through an example of how uh, some of the show prep actually plays out in real life. Uh, I went to the, the Automate show in Chicago last month. And I knew nobody there. We weren't even exhibiting. I was just there to check it out. I wanted to meet some people in our ICP and build my network in, in, in B2B SaaS and manufacturing. So the screenshot on the right here is, the, is a published exhibitor list I saw before the show. The Automate website actually published it. So I, I was interested in the attendees of the show, of course, but I also wanted to meet some of the exhibitors. So I took this list. We found a guy on, on Fiverr to pull the published list into a spreadsheet. I then uploaded that spreadsheet into sales Intel. I mean, you could also use like a zoom info or an Apollo IO, just something to get you company, uh, company data and contacts. We then sorted by company size to prioritize and pulled out contacts from that prioritized list who were likely to be at the show. Uh, I then took that list and uploaded all those companies and contacts uh, to HubSpot uh, where I could do some pre-show outreach. And, and here's what that looked like. Uh, I, I built out the sequence into a series of steps that I automated to deliver over about 30 days. And my ask was pretty simple. I, I just said, hey, I'm getting a, a small group of people together for lunch at, at 1 p.m. on Tuesday. You know, I positioned it as a way to share notes, like make connections, just general networking. And, and like any email sequence, you know, most people didn't respond. So some people politely declined and, and some accepted. So this is just one idea. And, and we've had mixed results with the lunch ask, but it's a nice low barrier to ask, and it's a great way to at least get conversations started. So if you have any great ideas, if anyone listening here has, has any great ideas for pre-show outreach, uh, feel free to drop in the chat. I'd, I'd love to hear what's working for all of you. 
on to what really matters. Um, <laughs> so some booths at a trade show impress you and draw you in. They have a banner that says just enough to be intriguing or a product on display that you kind of want to go touch. Or maybe their entire booth setup is just, as my middle schooler likes to say, giving. Then there are those booths that repel attendees, and it seems to be almost intentional. They've got a wrinkly tablecloth. They've got the same sad bowl of fun-sized candy that they've probably not refreshed since the last trade show. They've got those cheap pins that, you know, are going to fall apart in your hands. And passerbys can sense that booth is dialed in, and they will walk on by and try to avoid eye contact with the salespeople. So let's talk about how not to be that second kind of booth. First, let's talk about booth design and elements. Candidly, you really should not try to go cheap here. If you do have to go cheap, do not go cheap on design. If all you can get with your budget is a tablecloth for the six foot table and a nice standing manner, they need to work together and they need to look clean and simple together and intentional. You've got to remember that this is most people at the show's first interaction with your brand, and you need to create a presence that draws them in. To that end, your display needs to say what you do in the simplest possible terms, but it also needs to not say too much, because what you would like to have happen is someone's walking by, perusing the stands, standing in the middle of the aisle to make sure that they avoid pushy salespeople, and they spot your sign, your banner, they read it for about a second, and they think, huh, that, that seems relevant to me, and I want to know more. And that balance is going to look different for every brand. And those of you who do a lot of different things are going to have to really prioritize based on the audiences of the show that you're at. This can drive cost up because what you might end up with is different booth elements for different shows. And that's really something to consider when you're budgeting for your year up front. Your display needs to have prominent, memorable branding. So we have got Spectrum Aeromed versus Med Jets. Med Jets, yeah, they have a brand. It's not, you know, it's maybe circa... 2002 to be generous uh but then when you see them next to the booth of spectrum aeromed you kind of know which one's going to draw you in so really memorable branding a solid logo in a prominent place it's not really good if they remember what you do but not your name or your colors when they're trying to find you later you don't want them to end up at med jets thinking oh this could be spectrum maybe i should reach out overall what your display really needs to do is spark conversations. If you're incorporating seating for sales, don't put it behind the table at the back of the booth. You see there with med jets, that's set up for someone to stand behind the table and appear apart from you. Like you're separated. It's ominous to come up to. It doesn't feel friendly. If we look at Spectrum Aeromed, it's a more open design. There's nowhere for someone to hide behind a table. There's interactive elements. This is a booth that begs people to come in and talk to someone and ask questions, which is what you want. If you can illustrate your process or value proposition, you want to make something tangible that people can point to as they're talking. So your salesperson can talk through their uh, little pitch and point to different elements. Props are great. You can see Spectrum Aeromed there has some machinery that represents what they do. Props like mini games, it really depends on both your brand and the event. Do not do them just to draw people in. It won't draw your target audience in. It'll draw everyone in. We really want to just reach the people who are interested in us. If you can bring product or scaled versions of product or product output, that's a must have. But for those of us with less tangible deliverables, you want some way to display samples such as video or high quality printed materials. Beyond the booth, you want to be thinking well in advance, are there campaigns or other marketing activities that we want to plan around the event to really get the most bang for our investment? If you're able to at obtain that attendee list or exhibitor list, there's different ways you can market to those individuals. You might want to do an email, you know, day of the event or right before the event from your brand itself saying, hey, we'll be at brand XYZ. Come check us out. Here's what we do. You could geofence the event. This is a very effective way because you might have a whole bunch of prospects all in the same arena. You can geofence and then you can market to them for 30 days afterwards, helping stay top of mind with them as their post event. This is usually not a high cost tactic. And then, of course, you want to do social media. You want to do it before with a booth number and a description. You want to do it during with hi, here we are. And you want to do it after thanking the people you met. And you might even want to coach your salespeople on how to take the best selfie because marketing knows. Overall, it's really important to do some serious backwards planning, at least six weeks prior to the event, 
longer if you don't have existing supplies. Logistics and shipping all add strain to your budget and your timeline. And you really want to be conservative with your estimates. You also want to have sales on board with how conservative that timeline needs to be. What you don't want to hear is Seth says, hey, Aaron, the show's next week. Could I get a sweet business card? Mm -mm, no, Seth, you can't. So here's an example for printed materials and sales collateral. Like I said, you'll want to align your print pieces to sales' talk track so that they can actually illustrate as, your spe as they speak and they can point to relevant sections. So in our case, we have our talk track down to about three major bullet points. They're all represented on this trifold business card business card or other collateral, it still has to stand on its own because your salesperson isn't going to follow it home with your prospect. But think about how it can be an interactive piece during the booth experience. So speaking of these trifolds, these are something we've had pretty good success with both ourselves and for clients. I have seen a more extreme version that folded out origami style. That was a bit much. I feel like this version gives you just enough room to get across those key points more than a standard business card. But it also conveniently counts as only a business card if you're at an event where you are not an exhibitor. So that's our little tip of today on printed materials. And then finally, and Zoe, I believe you're launching a quick swag poll. The sprinkles on the cupcake that is your booth, swag. So swag, like everything else in life, it's a balancing act. You could skip it entirely, but where's the joy in that? What you wanna do is find something that's quality, not tired and relevant to your brand, ideally. You don't want to give away things like USB thumb drives or the pens that are going to fall apart right away that no one wants to use anyways. Tried and true options could include nice quality pens, nice bags, fancy notebooks. A note on bags, those will tend to go fast because people are looking for something to put all their other swag in. So if you're at an event where it's, you know, kind of shooting fish in a barrel, everyone's your target audience, bags are great. If you're at a show where your target audience is maybe 10% of the population, don't do bags. They're all get taken. We personally, we've had good luck with lip balm in a cute little round container. And there's lots of options out there. Another thing to consider is actually cheering your swag. So if you're going to one of those massive trade shows where most of the attendees are not in your target audience, maybe they're not decision makers, the swag that you actually put out should be lower cost. It shouldn't be something that they'll just throw away right away. And it should be well branded, but you're not going to go put out Stanley's. But you can have a little stash of the more expensive branded items under the table, under your tablecloth, that sales can pull out and give to high value targets. This is a great tactic to kind of have two tiers of what we're giving out at a trade show. The absolute best items are the ones that are going to get used. Bonus points for uniqueness to your brand or your industry, but those are bonus points. They're not the meat and potatoes of what makes good swag. The quality of the item reflects your values to the prospect. If you can't give something away decent, either don't do it at all or give away good snacks. No one ever complains about a bag of Cheez-Its. So again, you should have gotten a poll asking about the best swag you've ever received. We'll discuss that at the end of the webinar and I'm excited to see those results. So back to you, Seth. Nice. I'm glad you called out snacks. I'll get snacks at a booth, right? On to the part that you all say you're best at, right? What, what to do at the show. So sometimes we've probably all seen it, right? You're walking around and you see that booth where there's two people sitting back at chairs behind their tables, just like looking at their phones. Or sometimes it's maybe one person just like standing behind a table, like staring out into the abyss, like just hoping that the perfect prospect's going to come up and talk to him. Like, I know, I know what all these people are going to say when they go back to the office. It's like, hey, these trade shows just aren't working for us. Well, can't imagine why. I, I don't need to tell you, I don't need to say this, but I feel like I kind of have to say it out loud, right? When you're at a show, you are responsible for initiating conversation at, at your booth, walking around, waiting in line in the elevator, right? Like it's your responsibility to start conversations. And so like I, I, at this automate show, I was, I got there and there was a line a mile long and I struck up a conversation with the guy next to me. And it turns out I know somebody in a, in a complimentary industry. I actually ended up making an introduction for him after the show. And I just found that most people at shows and at, and at networking, networking events in general are just kind of trying to look like they fit in and not be awkward. And, and so you're, you're probably making them feel more comfortable by offering a conversation. All right, next, when covering your booth, stand out in front. If people have a name tag on, use their names. It's pretty hard to ignore your name. Hey, Seth, do you, do you have a second? And ask questions. This one kills me. You know, offer a compelling intro, but pivot to them as quickly as you can. 
but you want to make people feel important. Even if you find out that they're not your target prospect, right? Like you don't know who they know and you're both there for networking, right? Not necessarily transactions. When I'm going to show like my favorite people to talk to are our prospects, right? They're my favorite people to talk to. My second favorite people to talk to a show are salespeople selling into the same markets as me. Okay. That's super high value networking. So keep that in mind when you're meeting people. Uh, when walking the floor, uh, stick to your plan uh, and, and have a way to take notes as you talk to people. You know, you might have to stop pretty frequently and that's okay. Again, I use my little pocket notebook for that. We have another guy at Data who leaves voice recordings on his phone. He just looks like he's taking a call while he's walking the floor, and but he's actually leaving notes for himself. And set aside enough time to seek out the people you really want to talk to. If you have a list at a big show, make sure you organize it by booth number so you can easily get everywhere. And in general, it'll probably take you longer than you probably think it's going to take to get to everyone on your list. And the last thing too, is make sure you get in front of your follow-up and consider your asks for the show before you get there. And it doesn't have to be a sales meeting. Sales meeting is a pretty big, heavy ask. So I like to look for a little next steps. You know, I ask people if they're if they want to grab lunch or coffee at the show, like you're all at the show, ask them if they want to grab coffee at the show and offer a time, or maybe it's a dinner or drinks with you after the, the day's up, or maybe it is a, a half hour to connect next week. Even if it's just for networking or comparing notes from the show, don't be afraid to schedule it on the spot, pull up a phone and pull up your calendar and get a schedule. It's pretty hard to say no to somebody when they're right in front of you. And then consider a call to action specific for the event. So it might be a stacked event, like your company might put on a networking dinner immediately after the event or something else after the show to invite them to that, that creates a nice low barrier ask or next step. So Seth, quick thought. What if we did just a quick role play on what a good introduction looks like when someone asks like the, Hey, what does you, what do you guys do? <laughs> All right. Great idea. How about, how about I go first? All right. Hey, Seth, what does data do? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Right. Data is a full service fractional marketing firm focused on providing comprehensive marketing solutions from consulting to execution via a unique pod based team approach, you know, giving our customers full teams capabilities and know how for less than the cost of additional FTE. Right. We do brand and go to market consulting, full scale advertising across multiple channels with great CTRs and PPC and SEM and SEO and CRM integration and ABM and full funnel lobotomies. Would you like an assessment? Seth, that's awful. <laughs> we'll do that. Everyone, don't do that. Do, do you even care about your potential customer? All right. Well, if you're so smart, what, what, what do you think we should say? I'd probably say something like, you know, data is a fractional marketing company. You get the strategy, expertise, and execution of a full marketing team for a whole lot less than the cost to hire FTEs. I see you're with Skynet. I'm curious, what industries are you guys selling into? Okay, that's a lot better. That's a lot better. All right. So the important part here is to try to get them talking. Like if, if you ask good questions, you should find a way in. And by asking good questions, they're generally going to re reciprocate and ask you questions back. And, and one thing I always try to do in these conversations is dig out who they're selling to and who they want to meet at the show. Because once they've told you that, you have a whole lot more options in follow-up. Yeah. I've always found that it's way better to be the one asking the questions so that you can identify where you can add value and you really want to make them the focus of attention and feeling special. It's not about you, even if they're standing at your booth. All right. Now that we've conquered at this booth, let's conquer after the booth. So here is how after the show goes. If you leave the whole thing until after the show, you get home after who knows what kind of travel experience. You have approximately 400 to 2000 emails in your inbox. You have work that you probably really haven't been able to get to well enough for the past three days or so. So you've got to dig yourself back out and you've got to get on top of the day to day. On the other hand, you have business cards from who knows how many prospects in various pockets of your luggage and briefcase. And you've probably got a couple of really great leads you want to follow up on quickly. But you've also been away from home. So your kids and your pets are all over you and you feel guilty. So you don't want to work too late. You want to catch up on the series you missed with your spouse. And before you know it, two weeks have passed by and you don't remember what Dora from Explorix does, let alone what you were supposed to follow up on with her. You've really got to plan ahead and set future you up for success here. 
just acknowledge that you're going to be tired and brain dead once this is over and focus on getting everything into place now to make it as simple as possible for future you. That means block time on your calendar for follow-up well in advance of the show. Commit to it. Slap people's hands if they schedule over it. To get ahead, you can even draft those follow-up emails in your hotel in the evening or in the morning while you're still there and just plan to send them after the show is over. You could use a business card scanning app or enter the information into your CRM with a mobile app soon after you receive the card instead of you know, throwing them into the bottom of the bag you got for free. In addition to email, you can be connecting on LinkedIn, ideally in the same day so that it feels really natural. Realistically, you get about a week before the outreach starts to look stale. If someone emails you two months down the line saying, hey, we met at so-and-so event, you're like, what? Is this how you respond? Is this your normal speed of response, Mr. Salesperson? Because I don't think so. So you really do want to set future you up for success. This portion, the post-event portion, deserves as much attention as when you're at the show itself. It takes as much time, if not more. And one critical final step of any show is to have a team review. Sales and marketing needs to get in one room and they need to talk about how it went as soon as possible. Your discussion should include what went well, what could have gotten better? What did you actually get out of it? What's the immediate recognizable ROI here? Acknowledging that your sales cycle is probably long and you're probably gonna be working on this for a while, but was it promising? What are those things that you would do differently if you do go again? And maybe most importantly, should you go again? Right after the show is generally the best time to make that decision. So here's one thing that happens pretty often. You're left with these contacts who maybe aren't interested parties or potential customers who you want to stay in touch with, but maybe don't have a great next topic for. So this could be the guy in the booth next to you. You're both selling into the same market. You're not going to sell to him. He's not going to sell to you, but you could be useful to each other in connecting. So how do you get in front of those people and follow up? One solution we have found success with is arranging a virtual touch base, potentially with a whole group of people, to just swap insights gleaned from an event and have a general discussion about, hey, what'd you learn? What'd you find? What was interesting? Who'd you meet? Another option that's more one-on-one -on -one is to follow up with a contact exchange. So if you're following up with the guy from the booth next to you, say, hey, I met Todd and I met Brian and I think you should talk to him too. Here's their info. And hey, you can use my name as an introduction. Just say, I, say I thought you'd be a good fit. One thing we'd love to hear is just if there's anyone here that's found a technique here that really helps, go ahead and drop it in the chat and we'll discuss in our Q&A portion. All right. So let's uh, kind of taking it back out. Before the show, sales should research who's going to be there, do some good outreach and make a plan. Marketing has to get everything organized, prep material, begin planning earlier, probably begin planning early, probably earlier than sales is comfortable planning. And then at the show, always remember it's your responsibility to open conversations. You know, you want to do your best to prioritize your time and, and focus on building network, not just finding prospects. And then after the show, you got to plan your follow-up. That plan should be in place before you go. And then you have to let yourself get critical about how, how the event went, right? If you want to do it again next year and what you can do better in the future. So with that, we want to turn it over to you. We, we'd like to hear from you all. What questions do you have for us? Or is there anything you'd like to share with the group? Anything from the chat that anyone wanted to share? So looks like uh, we've got so a What are we seeing? So we've got Jason asking, given that they're equally filled out and aesthetic, do you think a bigger booth, 10 by 20, gives more reputability than a smaller one, 10 by 10? It definitely makes you look like you have more money to spend at a trade show, I would say. It makes you appear more prominent and like a big company. Depending on kind of your positioning within that marketplace, that's probably a good thing. But if you're trying to position yourself as the underdog upstart that's rebelling against a solution that's in place, you might not want to go with the biggest booth. But in general, if you're trying to position yourself as a market leader at that trade show, bigger is going to be better if, and I think the if is equally filled out and aesthetic. If you've got a six foot table with a tablecloth and a roll up banner, do not get the 10 by 20 booth. All right. Seth, anything you'd add to that? No, I thought that was spot on. It falls back to what you said is like in general, Try not to go cheap, especially if you want to be a position as a market leader. I think the larger booth is going to give you a leg up. Trina asks, will you cover best in class lead retrieval solutions? And Trina, I'm not quite sure if you're talking about like when we're scraping a website for leads or when we're trying to augment what we've scraped with data. So in general, 
if you can get the actual attendee list from the organization doing the trade show event, that's the best. And then you can load it up into, we use sales Intel. A lot of people use Zoom Info or Apollo IO. I think those are the market leaders out there right now. That's your best solution, but often they're not giving away that attendee information or you get it so late that it's not worthwhile in planning. What we have found success with then is if the event website lists booths, that's often where you can do your most upfront research. And then that also can be augmented with sales intel, Apollo, or Zoom info. I don't know if you meant something else by that, but if you did, please clarify in the chat or Seth, if you have other thoughts. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, attendee lists are, are gold. And even if they don't have them publicly available, it might be worth it just to reach out to the show organizer and ask if you can get it. The worst they can say is no, especially if you're sponsoring. That attendee list is sometimes the greatest value you can get out of a sponsorship. And if they want to keep you as a sponsor, they might be willing to offer it up to you. Thoughts on using brand ambassadors. So this is Kevin. Thoughts on using brand ambassadors in situations where we can't send more than one employee to a show. I've seen bad ones. I'm not going to lie. Like I, I, I would love, I would really like to see you send people who have real skin in the game and who know the product and brand and, and what you're trying to do with it. I'm sure some of them are good, but I would vet them closely. Hannah asks, I struggle with aligning my marketing and sales teams. How do I make marketing assets that align with my sales teams, talk tracks and vice versa? For one, they have to agree on what those talk tracks are. And that can be hard for marketing and sales because marketing comes up. It's it's like marketing sometimes comes up with something in the lab and then sales takes it out into the real world and they change it because it didn't work in the real world. And marketing has to be open to that feedback. They can guide the pitch, but they actually can't own it. The person giving it has to really own it mm -hmm. and get on the same page of the for the guts of it. It doesn't have to be word for word and try to hone it down to if this person walks away from this show, what two to three thoughts do we want them to still have about us? Those things and the order they come in should be the baseline for a lot of your marketing materials. And Seth, as the person who so often has to go out and give the pitch that marketing drafted for you, what do you have to add for that? Yeah, I was going to say, I think marketing just needs to work really closely with sales and, be, and, and sales needs to make it a comfortable space for marketing to talk to them too. Um, and, and marketing needs to really understand the value proposition. That's the hard thing when you go to uh, an outsourced creative vendor or something like that is that they haven't internalized the value proposition. They're just trying to make it look nice. And that's never going to work well with sales. Just I, I haven't seen it work well with sales. Great point to Kate on the, in the chat about having a prep meeting. It's really the backward planning that matters most being on the marketing side of things you want as much time as possible and setting up that pre-show meeting where you can align on strategies and tactics is huge. And giving them a cutoff date of, okay, we need everything to the printer by this date. Ideas you have after this date will not get executed on until next year can help there. And Trina says that they, this is a follow-up to the question about lead retrieval. They use Captello for capturing leads at the show. And it's nice because it links into Salesforce, but it does take time for sales to input prospect info. I don't think there's any getting away from entering prospect info. If Captello, which I'm not terribly familiar with, if it has a business card capture, that might be something that speeds it up. I know HubSpot's mobile app is built to be pretty on the go with entering people, but it has some weaknesses in terms of full scale functionality. But all in all, I think you just have to acknowledge that there is a chunk of time that comes after the show in terms of getting everything documented. And you don't want to just have the business card scattered across one person's desk. It's a matter of discipline in a lot of ways. And um, then Kate here asks, what should be included in a back wall banner graphic? What's too busy or too many photos? And no worries about having to jump, Kate. So in general, you want to give enough so that they understand what you do at a very high level but not so much that they don't need to talk to a salesperson anymore. And then you want to be very clear that if what you do is not clearing your name, that your name and the thing you do are separate and one is clearly your name and your branding. So your brand, your logo needs to come across memorably so that people can find you when they're Googling or looking afterwards and they know it's you. And then a little bit of text geared towards very high level, your value proposition. Yeah. Hey, one thing I like about this structure setup right here is, <laughs> Sorry, Seth. 
That's okay. So one thing I really like about the spectrum setup is they got a premium space. I mean, they have, a, there's a lot of room, but there are zero paragraphs of text in, in any of their setup, which is how many booths you walk by where you see, I mean, there might be 400 words on a banner and it's like, it's, it's not helping, but this is a great example of one that builds intrigue, you know, customized air ambulance solutions. It's strong. So I uh, thought I'd throw an example with that. Zoe, do we want to launch the poll results? Certainly. I'll put up the first one from the trade show strengths. Hopefully everyone is seeing that now. All right. So the area that was the least strong was the pre-show sales outreach. And hopefully we've given people some concrete ideas around that. Anyone get some ideas spurred by the conversation so far? And then Zoe, the one I'm really curious about, what was everyone's best swag? Yes. And I'm not see if this shows up properly. I do have a nice list of them as well. We had a case of vodka. Someone said they usually eventually use a notebook, hand sanitizer, band-aids, and that's for medical industry. Anything to use in a kitchen or bathroom, branded socks, and a nice tote bag. I agree with the tote bag. Socks have been big for a while now. As long as they're nice socks. For sure. Yeah. The quali quality for sure matters there. And then Jason comment as primary organizer, I will plan to send the exhibitor list to our scheduled reps. Yes, that is a great point. It's great to have everyone, even people maybe who aren't there, because they may have input on people they may want you to touch base with and connect with. Hannah says that she likes the idea of reaching out to the event organizer for information. Yeah. Now, if they're not handing it out for without being asked, there's always a chance they'll say no, but you don't get what you don't ask for. Okay. Right. Well, we're a little bit over time, so thank you for hanging on, everyone, and hope this was helpful and that you found things of value to bring to your next trade show event. And if you have any other ideas or thoughts for what we should cover in our next webinars, please shoot us an email.